It's my great privilege to uh, introduce our next speaker for this morning, Dr. Catherine McCarty. Uh, Dr. McCarty is uh, Director of Research at uh, Essentia Institute for Rural Health, uh, just north of here in Duluth. Uh, she has her educational roots here uh, in Minnesota with her undergraduate in public health degrees from uh, University of Minnesota. She then went to uh, finish her PhD at the University of Pittsburgh in epidemiology and has had a very productive and illustrious career in the areas of epidemiology and genetic epidemiology in a number of different, uh, number of different areas. Relevant to today's, uh, today's topic, she's been a, a PI on the Emerge um, Consortium, which was a large uh, uh, genetic and uh, biobanking study to link genetic information with uh, medical records with uh, some very profound uh, pharmacogenetic implications. Uh, she's obtained uh, millions of dollars in research to fund her work, and at last count, I had identified over 350 publications that she's had uh, resulting from um, her various investigations in epidemiology and genetics, so very prolific researcher. Uh, I've had the pleasure of getting to know her over the past, uh, past few months and a very wonderful person, and we're very thankful for her being here. So I'd like to uh, join me in giving her a warm welcome uh, to our conference, Dr. McCarty. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to speak. It's fun as an alumnus to come back. I want to tell you, take a couple minutes just to tell you a little bit about the history here of the Alumni Center. So if you see this slanted wall over here, part of the original Memorial Stadium built to honor the uh, veterans from World War I. And my degree, my uh, master's degree in epidemiology here, I had classes here in the old Memorial Stadium. So the original epidemiology faculty were here, and I have a book to recommend, uh, Medical Ethics, by Todd Tucker, University of Minnesota Press, called The Great Starvation Experiment. So conscientious objectors, including, in fact, my organic chemistry professors in undergrad, uh, wanted to contribute to the war effort in World War II, but not be on the front line, um, pacifists. And they were starved by Ansel Keys to look at what would be necessary to refeed people coming out of World War II. So uh, really interesting, right here uh, in the old Memo uh, Memorial Stadium. So this morning, in, in the 30 minutes I have with you, I want to talk to you about the Personalized Medicine Research Project, a biobank at Marshall Clinic that I worked with as part of Emerge, and then the Translational Genomics Research Projects that are going on both at Marshfield and what we're doing at Essentia Health in Duluth. So first, the Marshfield uh, Clinic Personalized Medicine Research Project. And do I have a pointer? Yes. Uh. So the map of Wisconsin, the, the lighter gray area is the service area for Marshfield Clinic. Let's go all the way to the screen. Ah, and the dark gray area is a, um, comprises 19 zip codes that we call the uh, Marshfield Epidemiologic Study Area, or MESA. And in that area, nearly all residents seek really all of their health care at the Marshfield Clinic or the affiliated hospital that the uh, doctors are provided from Marshfield Clinic. And interesting, I lived there for 10 years, but most people move there and don't move away. So this cohort's amazing for research, this biobank. 75% of the cohort have 20 years or more of medical history. Uh, so we're able to look at not just the incidence, of, but the progression over time of disease. The Marshall Clinic system of care includes all specialties and subspecialties, with the exception of whole organ transplant, and they tend to come here or to mail. They have an internally developed electronic health record um, you know, quite extensive for capturing um, all of their information then for both clinical and research purposes. So a brief summary of where the biobank is today. Only adults, uh, because population-based, it's not very effective, um, cost-effective to recruit kids who relatively have uh, fewer either conditions or medications, so we do instead case control studies in the uh, pediatric population. But it's a population-based biobank, so we recruited within that darker gray area on that previous map, trying to recruit everybody aged 20 and up, and we recruited 20,000 adults, 
aged uh, 18 to 102 at the time of enrollment into the study, similar to all the biobanks within the eMERGE network, and I'll show you a map of that soon, do not necessarily reflect the demographics. So women more likely to participate than men, so a higher representation of women than men than in the general population, very representative in terms of the ethnic composition of northern central Wisconsin, 98% European American. We have DNA plasma and serum samples. After about a year, we added a detailed dietary intake and physical activity questionnaire to allow us to do some gene environment studies. And all the participants were actively enrolled and consented to allow sharing of their data and samples with external investigators. We have access, obviously, to the medical records. And then the ability to recontact, which is really important. You know, the electronic health record great uh, electronic health record, but it's only what is there to coll uh, collect it for clinical purposes. We have GWAS data because of eMERGE for 5,000 subjects, and then what we call a molecular fingerprint, so a set of 40 SNPs on the entire cohort. And then whole genome sequencing has actually increased to about uh, double that, now about 50 subjects. This is one of the first studies we did, and I won't do, go into a lot of detail, but uh, the type of study that we're allowed to do with a biobank attached to this electronic health record. So we do the genotyping and then look in their medical record to see either what medication that they were on or disease that they have. And in this case, we looked at their st stable Coumadin or Warfarin dose. And for those of you who had, had your genotyping done, um, you will see CYP2C9 in your list. And I, in fact, so uh, this shows the uh, different genotypes possible for that gene, star one, star one, the most common, as you can see. Each of the points represents a single person. So for this particular study, about 600 subjects that were on warfarin long enough uh, not post-joint replacement, but long enough um, that they had, you know, long-term stable Coumadin doses in their medical record, star one, star one, the most common, to star three, star three. Um, you see that going towards the right, people end up with far less. The standard starting dose for those not familiar is five milligrams a day. For people with star three, star three at the far right, they have five milligrams a week. So that starting dose, not good, potentially going to have a bleeding reaction. Um, I looked at my, I'd not had this done before, so this is fun, my genotyping results this morning for myself and my son, and I did contact him, he's okay with me, me saying, I'm a star one, star three, he's a star three, star three. Yeah. Yeah. And in this room, so this is 600 people, he may be the only one actually in this room, or there could be potentially one other star three, star three, but I don't want him starting on a five milligram dose. All right, so the eMERGE Network, um, funded by the National Human Genome Research Institute. It started in, uh, nine years ago now. Traditional long grants at NIH are five years. Don't know why, but NHGRI tends to fund four years instead. The eMERGE Network, four-year grants. The IGNITE Network, I'm part of at Essentia, also a four-year grant. And then competitive renewals. So this shows the 12 sites for eMERGE two. Uh, includes ourselves, Marshall Clinic, and we've got lots of representatives, including Sue Belinsky, I know in the back, from uh, Mayo Clinic, Coordinating Center at Vanderbilt. So phase one was uh, really all about discovery and proof of concept. Could we use, could we actually connect genetic discovery where you didn't do the phenotyping, bringing somebody in and doing very standardized measurements, but you use the information available in electronic health records, so biobanks attached to electronic health record. In eMERGE 1, there were separately funded um, genotyping centers that, that did the genotyping, the GWAS genotyping, for, an, at that stage, five sites, including um, ourselves at Marshfield, and Mayo was part of the original five as well. Also very important to this whole engagement piece um, is the LC, or like uh, ethical, legal, and social issues. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, a couple slides ahead. Emerge phase two, again discovery. So looking at phenotypes, primarily disease-based, and doing the discovery with the GWAS data that we had. 
And then at this stage, implementation. So they wanted some pilot studies done in getting the genomic information out to the patients of the providers, not necessarily pharmacogenetic, but then we had a pharmacogenetic supplement that all sites had to specifically do some pharmacogenetic genotyping, and I'll uh, give you a little more details on that. So we did some qualitative research, and most sites did, in fact, prior to conducting our um, full-scale pilot uh, pharmacogenomic study. And we wanted to look at how do we effectively translate our genomic discoveries into clinical practice and getting both the patient and the provider perspectives. All the sites were doing something a bit different. <clears throat> and there's a methods paper out there. Uh, I'll show you what we did in a uh, comparison with some of the other sites. We had two pediatric sites, and so their gene drug pairs uh, different than what we're looking at the other adult sites. For ourselves, we were doing uh, genotyping that would impact uh, primary care. So we did some focus groups early on then with uh, two focus groups with a combination of family practice internal medicine docs, two with Marshville uh, clinic patients, again primary care patients, and one with the personalized medicine research project participants. And we did them separately just because we thought that they might have different reactions to this, having they received newsletters from us regularly um, and, and really know quite a bit more. So these focus groups, really interesting and interesting to compare across the eMERGE network. So at the sites that were going to be doing some genotyping relevant and sharing the results with the uh, specialists, especially cardiology and oncology, those were providers were far more accepting at this stage of pharmacogenetic results in their clinical practice. And the primary care we found, and this was true across the eMERGE network, are really far more cautious. It was really interesting. They were worried <clears throat> first about the time it would be required to keep up with this information because I'm just thinking, having my results now from myself and my son from today, I want my son's results in his medical record and how am I going to talk with his provider about what they mean and where does he put them in the medical record and how does he do um, additional genotyping. Worried a bit about the increase in, increase in patient questions. If people are bringing in all this information, how, how do they not feel stupid? And truly that's what we were hearing these providers say. How do they keep up and, and not feel ignorant? <clears throat> and then what we heard from them is they don't want to be the leaders. They want to wait until their professional organizations really effectively give it the good housekeeping seal of approval. They, they don't want to be driving this at all. The rural patients were interesting. They were very, even not just the ones already in the biobank and, and quite knowledgeable about this, but really very insightful in their discussion. They were concerned about discrimination from insurers and employers, not where federal legislation um, passed by President Bush in his last year in, in office, uh, GINA, to prevent discrimination, uh, at least from employment and health insurance. Can uh, still discriminate on life insurance, potentially. They had lots of discussion about the psychological con consequences. Well, what if I find out I'm going to get something or my child's going to get something? Do I really want to know this? I'm not so sure. Uh, ethical concerns related to social engineering. I don't know that we heard that necessarily across the eMERGE network at other sites, but we heard this in, uh, early on as well, concern about cloning and uh, a bit more conservative, I think, in rural America. And then they definitely felt that it should be the patient choice about whether or not to include that information in their medical records, which is interesting because if you ask them about blood pressure, they would not even consider whether or not blood pressure or blood cholesterol would be in their medical records. But they thought differently for uh, genetic results. So the aims of the pharmacogenetics administrative supplement to the eMERGE awards <clears throat> was to use PGRN-seq, and you saw in uh, Pamela's slide that uh, at least one, if not two of the sites, Mayo certainly is using this platform. Um, we selected people, used an electronic algorithm, the three-year supplement, so very short, um, did an electronic algorithm, who was not on one of the drugs for these drug gene pairs, but would be likely to be prescribed in the next one to two years so that we might be able to look at outcomes within the time frame of this supplement. 
And specifically at Marshfield, we were looking at 2C19 in clopidogrel, 2C9 in warfarin, um, VCOR C1 in warfarin, and SLCO1B1 in simvastatin. I know Mayo was looking at uh, 2D6 as well. And that really varied across the network. So Marshfield providers, as we'd seen in the focus groups that followed through when we were going to do this implementation, quite cautious uh, about what they wanted to include in their medical records and act on. In this, not just a research project now, but truly impacting clinical care, uh, the medical group had to uh, approve what was going to be included in the medical record. And then the next aim, again, across all sites as part of the supplement and emerge, was to integrate the CLIA-validated pharmacogenetic genotypes into the EMR with decision support uh, for the providers at that point of care. And then within eMERGE, uh, and these are accessible, uh, to develop a repository of those pharmacogenetic variants of unknown significance. So we used in my next three slides, just go for us at Marshfield, we used the CPIC guidelines developed by the Pharmacogenetics Research Network. Uh, to de for the decision support, okay, given a, a certain genotype, what's the recommendation for dosing for the provider? And this comes up as an alert in the electronic health record that's developed by Marshville Clinic. And you see for uh, warfarin dosing, we use, again, those both two genes, the VCOR-C1 and the CYP2C9. And then the recommended starting daily dose uh, and the range The simvastatin guidelines based on um, phenotype, normal function, intermediate or low function, and then again the recommendations for starting either on the just recommended disease specific dose or a lower dose or other statin for people with a higher myopathy risk based on genotype. And then the uh, clopidogrel, and you'll hear a bit more about this from another speaker later on. So Marshall enrollment, we enrolled 750 people, actually 752, and then uh, two had dropped out early on. What's really interesting here, remember from my previous slide that for the general biobank, population-based biobank, far more uh, women than men. Not so much, and, and really this time because we had that targeted recruitment and enrollment for people more likely to go on one of these three drugs in the next one to three years. And so by decade of birth, and then male and female, males the lighter blue and females uh, the darker blue, you see the actual numbers of enrollment over the 750. And especially for that long, younger and very uh, older age groups, you see more men than women, and really because of the likelihood of being prescribed one of those three meds, more likely. So some preliminary results for the three, and really very preliminary. We won't have final results on this till probably the beginning of next year, in fact. <clears throat> so again, 750 people enrolled. I'll take you through just briefly each of the three drug pairs that we're looking at. For clopidogrel, 198 of the 750 enrolled have a clinically actionable variant. And this was determined uh, across the eMERGE network, what would be clinically actionable. Eight subjects were prescribed uh, clopidogrel on or after that alert being available. It doesn't fire, although we call it an alert, it actually doesn't fire as an alert until a patient is either going to be prescribed in anything relation, in, uh, relation to prescribing in their medical record. So one person was prescribed uh, clopidogrel after the alert of the eight. Um, the other seven of those uh, prescribed did not have an actionable alert. And so that, that one of eight, the physicians did not use this, and we, we need to go back into the medical record and see why they chose not to uh, act on the alert that they got. And then for symphostatin, 219 of the 750 subjects have uh, clinically actionable results that, that could be an alert if symphostatin fires for them. Nine subjects were prescribed simvastatin after the information was available. Three of them had that alert fire. Two patients were maintained on the current dose because they'd already been on that dose for a long period of time when the alert, when the alert had fired, which shows you it's not just the genotyping then that matters. And then for warfarin, this was interesting. Uh, this is where we saw 
the smallest percentage of providers acting on the alert as recommended. And the, the thought on this, and we have to do some further qualitative research, is that warfarin is managed, and it is in a lot of healthcare systems, by an anticoagulation or warfarin Coumadin clinic, it's called, and that they, they have very tight monitoring and maybe not used to doing this, and perhaps we should have done more of our homework ahead of time and speaking uh, with the Coumadin clinic providers. Uh, but of 17 people that had the alert fire uh, after warfarin uh, was prescribed, three were given a greater dose than recommended, four were given a lower dose than recommended. Uh, so seven of the 17 doing something different than was recommended. Which again, for my son, I would not be happy with given his genotype of star three, star three. All right, so what are we doing in essential health now? Uh, this map shows the, the uh, geographic area of essential health. The three colors represent geographically how we divide ourselves out administratively, west central and the eastern region. We have a family health history study I won't talk to you about. <coughs> Excuse me, it's part of <clears throat> IGNITE going on just in the east. Some of our things go across the, the whole network. We are what's called horizontally integrated for the most part. So that, say, um, pediatrics, internal medicine, family practice has one person, of a provider, over the um, practice geographically, the entire, uh, all of the regions, of the, all the three regions. So as I said, for Emerge 2, one of the aims was that we were all of the sites in uh, Emerge 2 were meant to conduct pilot genomic medicine projects. And for most of us, uh, and so sharing results back with the patients and providers, clinically actionable results, but for most of us, we said we can't share our results because we had set up our biobanks using non-CLIA certified um, handling of our samples, which then does not allow us to share that information for medical purposes. So for our pilot then, rather than uh, using the biobank in Marshfield, we recruited new people uh, at Essentia Health. And for this genomic medicine pilot, we wanted to look at um, people's responses. Why would they choose to be involved in a study like this, have gen uh, predictive, in this case, predictive testing done for age-related macular degeneration? How can we get that information into the medical record? Because we use EPIC, um, and there's not really a a, as of yet, at any rate, a standard way to get geno genomic information in there so that it's easy to get back out for the providers. It usually goes in our lab results. It's what's called a stan scanned document, which is not even indexed particularly well. And then look at their response. So after they've participated, then how, how do they react to their results? All right, by way of background, age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, is the leading cause of blindness in the elderly. Very common eye condition. Uh, risk factors include smoking, nutrition, genetics, and one of the genes, oh, thank you so much. Um, one of the genes that may be associated, that is associated from uh, GWAS studies is complement factor H. And it's thought to predict half of AMD. I don't personally believe it's that high, but a lot. Uh, treatment options for uh, what's called wet AMD, but not dry. So <clears throat> on the left-hand side of the slide, you see normal retina. So an optometrist or ophthalmologist looking at the back of the eyes, this is what I want to see. Nice, healthy, clear blood vessels with neovascular or new growth, age-related macular degeneration. And, and we think because of a lack of oxygen, new growth, new blood vessels at the back of the eye, and there's new blood vessels that grow are not particularly strong. So they break and you see with neovascular on the right side um, blood and lipid or fat deposits on the retina that obviously then uh, get in the way of vision. And in fact, this is how vision is affected because you lose your central vision. People are given uh, what's called an Amsler grid. In fact, they're given magnets to put on the refrigerator and, and asked to look one eye at a time on a daily basis to see if they notice any difference. Any waviness, come on in, you've potentially got some damage, and you lose that central vision. So the methods for this study, 
We recruited through optometry, people aged 50 to 65 without a personal history of age-related macular degeneration. Initially, we were recruiting people with a family history and then relaxed that to include people um, without a known, known is key here, uh, family history of age-related macular degeneration. We did a blood draw and extracted the DNA to Sencha and then sent the uh, DNA sample to Arctic DX that did the genotyping, and then they produce a risk score based on the genetic information and then some personal information such as smoking, age, and gender. The opto our optometrist was just superb, and he wanted to return the results himself, which is good because we have a dearth of genetic counselors to, to do this anyway, probably. And then we did follow-up phone interviews to see within three to six months how people had used that information. So this is a risk score that's generated. It includes um, four different genes, whether or not people smoke, and then recommendations based on that risk score and smoking. And you see the five different risk, uh, risk categories that are generated, looking at a lifetime risk of uh, developing advanced age-related macular degeneration. So the recommendation besides sort of standard health things, people will get a targeted recommendation of an antioxidant, and it's a formula from the age-related eye disease study, which had been funded a number of years ago now, probably more than a decade ago, from the National Eye Institute. Um, something available, a number of companies market this multivitamin as the formula from this AREDS study. It includes antioxidants, and the recommendation changes as to whether or not somebody is a current smoker. So if they're a current smoker, uh, they do not have beta carotene, which has been shown to increase the risk of lung cancer in current smokers. So results, we sent letters out to 147 potentially eligible, 50, age 50 to 65. Couldn't reach some. Um, we were just amazed at the response. So huge response, 85% uh, of people participated. We had staff wanting to participate. In fact, I had to contact our institutional review board and say, you know, to see if that was okay with them, which they were okay with. We were not coercing our employees to participate, but really an overwhelming response to this. Because of the way we recruited initially, most did have a family history of age-related macular degeneration. And what was really interesting, we didn't have a lot of people that came across with high genetic risk, so a really high risk score for advanced AMD in their lifetime. A lot of us will develop early, but not necessarily the advanced. <clears throat> but even with that, most people had either made changes or said that they were already doing the things, protecting their eyes from the sun, uh, eating well in terms of antioxidants to protect their eyes and lower the risk of AMD. So I think our, our uh, optometrists did a really good job of communicating that information about risk to them. And then we're looking to add this test clinically, so CMS will pay for this test, as indicated. So the next two slides show some research that I had done in Australia, and I think it's really why people did something. So people are really afraid of losing their vision. So as I said, not many people um, identify as high risk of developing advanced AMD. But they just don't want to do that, obviously. So um, we've done a study in Australia looking at the impact of vision impairment specifically from this condition, AMD. And on the right, just the odds ratios for various activities of daily living, uh, various functioning things. And people with AMD are almost 12 times as likely to be dependent on others, 10 times as likely to have difficulty reading a newspaper, 41 times as, as uh, likely to be dif have difficulty seeing faces, so very, people are very concerned about this. And then we'd ask the question, two questions. Uh, one, the, uh, the first, which disease would somebody first put money into research to prevent? And then which disability would people, if given you had to prioritize with limited resources, treat and support? And overwhelmingly, more, more than half of people say total blindness. So I, th I think that had some impact as well as the genetic results in, in terms of people's behavior on, on that uh, pilot. 
So there is a poster, I think about right there, uh, a study that we're currently doing, funded by the Duluth Clinic Foundation at Essentia Health. In collaboration with Jacob Brown here, we are recruiting 200 people, 200 kids, into a pilot study to look at the C SNPs in the CS1 gene and response to methylphenidate or Ritalin used to treat ADHD. And we're about halfway through our recruitment on that project. So I want to uh, thank our participants in our, in our studies. The research that you've seen here is funded by the National Human Genome Research Institute, the Emerge Network, by the Essential Health Duluth Clinic Foundation for our methylphenidate study and actually the Victorian government for the couple slides I presented on people's fear of blindness from AMD. Thank you. <laughs>